I'm glad to be with you today. This is Chuck Brokay from Salton Valley. You know, we're asked to read the Book of Mormon, but why not the Doctrine and Covenants or Mormon history? Ether tells of three godly witnesses, but from what we have seen, is that true? Then why did the Mormons in far west Missouri threaten Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer, among others, to get out, since they were of a gang of counterfeiters, thieves, liars, and blacklegs of the deepest dye, to deceive, cheat, and defraud the saints out of their property? Senate Document 189, February 15, 1841. So they were driven out. Then the people of Missouri drove out most of the Mormons. So what's up? How many Quakers were chased out of states? Amish, Hindus, or the Chinese. You know, Americans are tolerant, and they respected people's rights and the law. But if you are a David Koresh or a Warren Jeffs, the law will deal with you. LDS historian Stephen LeSueur wrote that Joseph Smith in 1831 made Jackson City, Missouri, the site for Zion. He said the Mormons were partly responsible for the suspicions and prejudice against them. And why not? When they threatened to establish the kingdom of God there, even to tread upon the ashes of the wicked after they were destroyed from off the face of the earth. You know, people could not threaten early Americans and expect to be called a people of love and peace because spotting danger, they believed in survival. It was a scary time. Thousands of Mormons were claiming the land as their inheritance and to be taken by force. It was theirs by the gift of the Lord. It was folly for them, the Missourians, to improve their lands. They would not enjoy the fruits of the labor that it would finally fall into the hands of the saints. A Mormon journal from Independence published by Joseph Smith, Revelation in July 1831, the Lord declared, I will consecrate the riches of the Gentiles, non-Mormons, unto my people, which are the house of Israel. And the Indians were to build the kingdom by punishing God's enemies to drive them out. 1838, Mormon War, Missouri, pages 16 to 18. Now what is going on? Haven't the Mormon leaders already expressed violence against their own people? Yes, they did. And Richard Bushman commented, Mormons believed they were building Zion according to God's commands, but to apostates and outsiders, they look like mindless zealots obeying a tyrant. So the Missouri people were concerned about Mormons going beyond the law whenever the prophet required it. That's in Joseph Smith, Rough Stone and Rolling, pages 353-354. You know, Missouri has really gotten a bad rap from the Mormon church. We need to dare to question. Were you given the true information and missionary lessons before you join the LDS? Why not make eternal decisions based upon truth? I mean, now where would you turn? Well, friend, turn first of all to Jesus. Yeah, you really do. Uh, if you've been starved for the truth about Jesus Christ and the Mormon church, pick up the Bible and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace. So high as the heavens above, so high is the measure of the Father's love. Greetings, friend. This is Chuck Roquet from Salton Valley. Hey, do you like mysteries? Well, there are mysteries here in the Book of Mormon, like looking into Ether 3 to ask, Whose finger is this? Well, the stonemaker in the chapter knows. Uh, but wait, then, then he doesn't know. At a loss, this guy asks, What would you have me do? And then in desperation, a guy makes rocks that are like transparent glass. Is this truth or 19th century fiction? Then Mr. Desperation pleads, Touch these stones to make them shine. So he gets two for each boat. You know, we're asked to read the Book of Mormon. Now here's that ether journey. First, picture trailer homes the length of a tree. We have Jared, his brother, their wives, and 22 friends, so apparently 26 people. And in their homes, they have barnyards of animals, including like hay, food, and water for almost a year. No one leaves, but the good news is, at least they're not being thrown around on the water. Well, that's just a scenario, for example. But Spencer W. Kimball in his LDS conference report in April 1963 explained, the first recorded ocean crossing was about 40 centuries ago of seaworthy ocean-going vessels, eight barges like and near contemporary with Noah's Ark, long as a tree, tight as a dish, peaked at the end like a gravy boat, see Ether 217, corked at top and bottom, illuminated by molten stones, perhaps a radium or some other substance not yet rediscovered by our scientists. Light and like, like a fowl upon the water, 
This fleet of barges was driven by winds and ocean currents, landing at a common point in North America, probably on the west shores. The student manual of the Book of Mormon quote. Are they like Noah's Ark? Do eight yachts compare to a ship? How many airplanes have you ever seen on a yacht? Noah's flood was 150 days, Genesis 7:24. The Jaredite journey is 344 days, Ether 6:11. The ark floated on top of the water. These barges go to the bottom. Noah had fresh water from downpouring rain. These barges had a little hole that opened. They were not deep in the sea. Traveling by ocean and by currents, would eight boats be within hundreds of miles of each other? Would they actually cross the ocean or stay on the bottom? Halfway around the world, all eight end up at the same place. Like we find glass fishing balls from Japan that randomly cross to America or New Zealand or Russia or wherever to release helium balloons here. How would you know that they would all end up in Denver? So a man says to his wife, surprise, we're going on a barge. Is there a tugboat, sail, props, rudders? Joseph Smith probably saw mules pulling barges on the Erie Canal. There are no mules at sea. So you see, he was the author of the Book of Mormon, as on the title page of the 1830 edition. All you need to do is Google IRR and the 1830 Book of Mormon. And there you get photocopies. In Treasures from the Book of Mormon, volume 4, page 4258, it says, of course, whenever there was a storm, which turned out to be most of the time, they would have to stop up the hole again so they would not be drowned. So climb aboard. A wife says, no way, they're overloaded. We'd go straight to the bottom. Her husband says, no, they are small. And quote, light upon the water, even like the lightness of a fowl upon the sea, Ether 2.16. So light on the water, with rough seas most of the time, full of animals. Wow. Let's find some Hollywood actors for a 344-day movie in eight boats. Problem is, you'd never see him again. Is the Book of Mormon scripture? Test the Bible like this and you will see, this is the Word of God. The preface of Ether 2 says, The Jaredites prepare for their journey to a promised land, and they build barges. Well, verses 1 through 3 describe preparing for the journey to the promised land with flocks. Over in chapter 6, verse 4, also herds. Who made the trip? Verse 1, Jared and his brother and their families and also the friends of Jared and his brother and their families, lots of people. Imagine a prince's cruise of 11 months where everybody brings their pets. Well, these barges are small, verse 16. Verse 2, and they did lay snares and catch fowls of the air. They did also prepare a vessel in which they did carry with them the fish of the waters. You know, birds are everywhere, so I bring birds. Did they have many cages, large cages? It takes something like that. I was interested, too, in their fish, so I stopped by Petco. Their aquariums need oxygen and filters. Although these barges got a hole in the top and a hole in the bottom for air, that would not help the fish. And crossing the ocean, ocean, why take fish? I asked the worker at Petco, suppose I put fish in a tank for 344 days without pumps. What would happen? She said, I'll die. So I appealed to the Book of Mormon for credibility and told about this journey. Unconvinced, she said firmly, they would not make it. Both the fish and the birds of the Americas are distinct from the old world species. So did they die on the journey? If so, then why would God include these insights if it did not work out? And they brought the Deseret, verse 3. They did also carry with them Deseret, which by interpretation is a honeybee, and thus did they carry with them swarms of bees and all manner of that which was upon the face of the land, seeds of every kind. What is Deseret? Well, I ask an Egyptian or a Hebrew linguist to clarify. It means honeybee, right? Well, they know nothing of a Deseret. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the Europeans were the first to bring the bees. An excerpt from the statement of the Smithsonian Institute of Technology on the Book of Mormon reads, None of the principal old world domesticated food plants or animals except the dog occurred in the New World in pre-Columbian times. American Indians had no wheat, barley, oats, millet, rice, cattle, pigs, chickens, horses, donkeys, camels, before 1492. So as kindly as possible, here's what they're telling us. It didn't happen. It just didn't happen. Quite a story, but it's not true. Uh, we were on a boat about the length of a tree on the Yukon River. Going downstream was no problem. But coming back up, we had five moose. The top of the boat was just clearing the water by inches. So reaching Galena, two moose were flown ahead. Now it seems like in this story, someone would say, I'm staying behind. When you clear this dock, your barges are going straight to the bottom. Or a man looks at his family and says, I'm scared. I don't like the looks of these holes. Why is there a hole in the bottom? Ether 220. 
My friend said, no wonder there's no record of them reaching America. Well, picture, you know, Joseph Smith telling this tale to a farmer in a drafty barn. Maybe he would believe it. But sailors ought to know better. The barges are small, the length of a tree, ether 2, 16, 17. What happens in a, a valley of the ocean floor where there's little current, no way to bob up for air? You see the jeopardy of the Jaredites as they would sink as a whale in the midst of the sea. For the mountainous waves shall dash upon you. That's Ether 224. And they go to the depths. Why doesn't the LDS Church cast a real movie of this brutal voyage? Or here's an idea. Go treasure hunting on the Titanic with scuba gear at the bottom of the sea. Why not? It takes a submarine. And sure not a wooden boat. What about a long storm, as the wind did never cease to blow, Ether 6-8? You know, people today use ships much like Noah's Ark. But these Jaredite barges were shaped like a dish, Ether 217. To be under the surface, what happens to a dish? It spins and tumbles in the water as these mountainous waves crash down upon them. Going upside down, you know, the writer foresaw the need of a hole in the bottom since the bottom becomes the top. And there's no glass, so what about fish tanks? How did that work, like flipping over? Wouldn't these tanks be like coffins to the fish? Angry bees, bird feathers everywhere. How many got crushed by the flocks and herds that were in there, chapter 6, verse 4? You see, if you have claustrophobia, this is not for you. Or if barking dogs keep you awake at night, well, think of the terror of those howling animals as the entire civilization of the new world runs for cover, but there's nowhere to go. The LDS Church emphasizes food storage until families are picking bugs out of their dry goods. Well, for climate control, look at the humidity in there, and how would you stop the mold? In Ether 6.4, they prepared all manner of food that thereby they might subsist upon the water, and also food for their flocks and herds. A small herd for a short winter needs a big stack of hay. You know, if I was a bishop, I'd rather not discuss it. Well, the first presidency does not want to talk about it either, at least not yet. Hey, people want to know, have you read the Book of Mormon? We might respond, have you read the Book of Mormon? For our Navy ship during war games, they would shut the hatches and turn off the vents. Man, the air was bad. Shut off the air in a submarine, and where are you then? You're dead. You know, up on our roof, I leaned over near a vent and got a rush of the sewer fumes. <laughs> it's a good way to get a headache. You see, these Book of Mormon boats have no bathroom fans. Drive past a hog farm and just stop the car and listen to the kids. Or you're in a stinking public toilet and the door is locked. And what about these floods at sea, Ether 224? At sea, we had waves, swells, and spray, but never floods. Joseph Smith saw floods in New York State, right? But floods in the ocean? Their only floods would be the floods of urine. You see the waves drenching their food, polluting their water, or drowning the kids. And do you know how much manure builds up during a winter in a cow barn? Or 11 months as these barges roll through the water... If you ever worked on hog farms, you know, slop, slop, you've got to get that stuff out of there. A guy hands you a bucket and says, we have to dump urine over the top. You want the top or the ladder or the bottom? I'm not taking the bottom, I'm taking the top. None of that stuff dripping on me. So our happy Jaredites are going merrily through the sea. You don't know heroes until you've read this story because, again, our Navy ship facing heavy seas, we heard more cursing than singing. The typhoon was bad, but we never had mountainous waves or to roll to the bottom of the sea. My wife is extremely helpful and cheerful, but she would not be happy. Ladies love hygiene, but these Jaredites, angelic. Watch these ladies chasing a toddler, slipping through dark stalls, knee-deep in dung, and while the crafts are going crazy, tossing upon the waves, Ether 6-5. Maybe your husband asks, how are you handling this today? I've not had a shower for months, but that's okay, he says. I'd hug you if you didn't smell so bad. We're not praying about the Book of Mormon today. We're examining it. God says to test it, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Let's join these people on their cruise. I'm trying to picture down like a whale in the sea. And among the birds, flocks, and herds, there are maternity wards. Oh, you'd think so because the children began to be many. Did these people wait to have their children at sea? You know, if you start having babies 344 days later, you still have babies. So Ether 6.16 explains, And the friends of Jared and his brother were a number, about twenty and two souls, and they also begat sons and daughters before they came to the promised land, and therefore they began to be many. It adds up to like three or four people per boat. You know, these are busy people. 
And in Ether 6, 9 explains, And they did sing praises unto the Lord. Yea, the brother of Jared did sing praises unto the Lord. And he did thank and praise the Lord all the day long. And when the night came, they did not cease to praise the Lord. Wow. Picture the Mormon Tabernacle Choir in these boats. How would they feel with such a place to sing? So Joseph Smith, tell us more about these travelers struggling to breathe down there. In Ether 4.15, they struggled with unbelief, and they are in an awful state of wickedness, hardness of heart, and blindness of mind. But at sea, they are so angelic, just to praise and praise and praise. Seasick or not, they thanked the Lord and sang day and night, Ether 6.9. You know, poor Job struggled to understand his trials, but these people didn't care. Brigham Young could not stop his wives from complaining in the beehive house, but these shed tears of joy, Ether 612. Then on the surface, they bob up, suppose they're there at the same time, one cries, It's awful down there! How are you doing? No problem. We were tumbling out of control under mountainous waves. We were at the bottom of the sea. Some of the horses died and the cattle got the bends. How'd you manage that? Robed in the darkness of the sea, this choir had no white shirts and no fine dresses, no windows, just cabin fever and claustrophobia, but they sang. So he cries out, we sang, we're happy day and night. We just praise the Lord. What did you do? Well, we sang too. So here are boats upside down, then right side up and facing the worst trip in history with crazy storms. They sang. Jesus was in a boat with his disciples in Matthew chapter 8. There was a great tempest in the sea insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But Jesus was asleep. The disciples awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, why are ye fearful? O ye of little faith. In Luke 8, the boats are in jeopardy. So these men of the sea are crying out, Master, Master, we perish. But in this Jaredite jeopardy, what amazing attitudes. Too bad Moses did not know about their heroism. The complaining Israelites of the wilderness needed this example. You know, they came later. But somehow these Jaredites, long before them, knew all about Israel and the land to come. Friend, I'm going to stick with the Bible. Hey, we love our Mormon friends. But you know, in comparative religions, we just don't always agree on a lot of things. And we're encouraged to read the Book of Mormon, so let's check it out. I have some questions from Ether 9, 18 and 19. An LDS faith-promoting story is of a man who crossed the ocean on a little craft. Now, is that comparable to the Jaredites? We might compare a child's toy to the Union Pacific. Or is it equal to say man has walked on the moon and man walks in Utah? You see, these ether dishes were filled with animals and people for nearly a year. It's not just a man on the ocean. Ether 9.18 says, All manner of cattle, of oxen, and cows, and of sheep, and of swine, and of goats, and also many other kinds of animals that were useful for the food of man. Well, in the first place, cattle were not here at this time. And what is this to say swine being useful for food? If these Jaredites are Hebrews from 2500 B.C., which is impossible in itself, why bring hogs, which are not kosher to eat? And then in the next verse, 919, our horses and asses and there are elephants. To teach about America, did the Indians follow buffalo herds or elephant herds? Do we read today of Buffalo Bill or Elephant Bill? The buffaloes are here, but what happened to the elephants from the Book of Mormon? The prehistoric horse was extinct and horses arrived with the Spaniards. If the Jaredites came after the flood, these apparently came on their boats. So don't let the elephants spray and waste the fresh water on the boats, right? Keep the elephant centered in the boat. Hope it doesn't flip. Consider a semi-driver with a load of hogs. Does he clean the trailer when the hogs are in there? How would you do that? So how would they clean these boats? Now here comes Barnum Bailey Circus down the tracks. The whole show is on eight train cars. Well, you know, if you have a 50-pound dog, you regularly are buying 50-pound bags of dog food. Okay, how many of these eight train cars would it take just for the food for nearly a year? The calves become heifers. Piglets grow to full size. And baby elephants grow to nearly half their size in a year. The displacement and climate control are impossible. Or picture yourself in Nauvoo a long time ago, and you have two choices. You can walk to Utah or take a reverse ocean voyage. Ride the barges by ocean currents back to Israel. Now talk about pioneer choices. Like, who would do that? We know about the Titanic and many ships in the ocean graveyard, so no fool would get on these barges packed out with animals and head to the Old World. Have you read the Book of Mormon? Have you prayed about it? People might equally ask, have you read the Joseph Smith translation? Have you read how he wrote himself into the Book of Genesis in his translation? So who would pray about that? We must first examine why he did that. Are these books true? 
Ether 919 says the people of America had horses and asses, and there were elephants and kirloms and cummins, all of which were useful unto man. But if cummins are useful, what are they? No one knows. And if it wasn't for Orson Pratt speaking December 27, 1868, we would not know what curlooms are either. Curlooms are mammoths. Really? So this legend, Orson Pratt, taught a lot of things, but are these Mormon teachers credible? If he was wrong, why did he say this? Joseph Smith claimed there are Quaker-like men on the moon. Well, we live in an enlightened age, so a minister inquired of the returning astronauts, say, I have a question. Yes. Did you see any Quakers up there? No Quakers. Why did he teach this? Brigham Young preached that anyone with black skin is cursed. Always so. Was he lying? Well, then why? Is it all right that the living prophets and spokesmen for Mormonism were so grossly wrong? How then do you know if men like President Hinckley or Prophet Monson teach the truth? You would trust the LDS living prophets over the Bible? I know it's hard to question, but you have to do this if you want to have eternal life. Your choice is whether to believe in the Bible or the writings of men. Relevant faith is not based on the claim to be true, but on real information. We are often invited to read the Book of Mormon, but reading it leads to more questions. Do you have your copy handy? Is the God of the Bible in Exodus 25 the same God as the God of the Book of Mormon? God gave precise instructions for building the Ark of the Covenant. Then in Genesis 6, God has exact directions for building Noah's Ark, directions and dimensions corresponding to ship blueprints for today. This Book of Mormon God, beginning in Ether 2.16, tries to instruct on how to make boats. Poorly planned, there is no lighting or ventilation. After panic and complaining, there is no sympathy. Profound, the God says, you cannot have windows because they would shatter. Actually, there were no windows in 2700 B.C. The Phoenicians had never invented glass yet. See the fifth point of the Smithsonian Institute of Technology that is available online. Then, you cannot go by the light of fire. Well, imagine trying to feed the fires in these little boats for close to a year. At a loss, this God asks, what would you have me do? It's like, would God ask Noah, like, how to shut the door of the ark? Then in chapter 3, in desperation, a guy makes rocks that are like transparent glass. Is this truth or 19th century fiction? Then Mr. Desperation pleads, touch these stones to make them shine. So he gets two for each boat. Are the massive loads on different decks or on one level? Did big and little animals run loose or were they in stalls? Does a light at each end of the boat solve it or would they cry, hey, move over there, like who's blocking the light? Uh, imagine, for example, building the temples at Nauvoo and someone announces, prophet, we have no doors. His solution, make a hole in the top and hole in the bottom. Well, that would be foolish for temples, you know that, but equally foolish for boats. Like who made rocks to shine at Nauvoo? Does God give shining rocks in Salt Lake City to light the temple? Is it just a matter of faith, or is this a far-out story of a God that forgot about fresh air and lighting? Well, hear from the Bible. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Romans 11, 33 and 34. In Job 38, 2 through 4, the Lord asked Job, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare it if thou hast understanding. In Job 40, verses 2 through 5, Shall he that contendeth through the Almighty instruct him? He that re reproveth God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. You see, my dear friend, the choices are two. Either the man-made gods that leave you grasping and desperate, without answers, limited, or the almighty God who's ready to save your soul. Friend, please don't miss the God of the Bible. Hey, do you like mysteries? Well, there are mysteries here in the Book of Mormon. Like looking into Ether 3 to ask, Whose finger is this? Well, the stonemaker in the chapter knows, uh, but wait, then, then he doesn't know. And a mystery within a mystery is to ask, who is Christ? Or who is the anointed one, the Jewish Messiah? Well, the prophets of old didn't know after pouring over the Hebrew scriptures because Christ is not named in the Old Testament. But these Jaredites from the Tower of Babel, 
They knew all about him. Back to the future. Why know about Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jerusalem? Most of us are not going to believe this, but let's hear from these ancient prophets in the Book of Mormon. Stonemaker requests in Ether 3, 4, For the benefit of man, therefore, touch these stones, O Lord, with thy finger. Well, verse 6, The veil was taken from off the eyes of the brother of Jared, and he saw the finger of the Lord, and it was the finger of a man like unto flesh and blood. So a finger like flesh and blood. So this stonemaker confesses in verse 8, I saw the finger of the Lord, but then I knew not that the Lord had flesh and blood. Well, he, he knew God has a finger. He didn't know the finger was a finger of flesh and blood. Uh, Mormonism does not like to recognize the biblical figures of speech. Dr. Walter Martin said, If the Mormons are to be consistent in their interpretation, they should find great difficulty in the psalm where God is spoken of as covering with his feathers and man trusting under his wings. If God has eyes, ears, arms, hands, nostrils, mouth, etc., why then does he have feathers and wings? The Mormons have never given a satisfactory answer to this because it is obvious that the anthropomorphic and metaphorical usage of terms relative to God are literary devices to convey his concern for and association with man. In like manner, metaphors such as feathers and wings indicate his tender concern for the protection of those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The Mormons would do well to comb the Old Testament and the New Testament for the numerous metaphorical usages readily available for observation. In so doing, they would have to admit, if they are at all logically consistent, that Jesus is not the door, John 10:9. A shepherd, John 10, 11. A vine, John 15, 1. A roadway, John 14, 6. A loaf of bread, John 6, 51. And other metaphorical expressions, any more than our God is a consuming fire, means that Jehovah should be construed as a blast furnace or a volcanic cone. So from verse 20, this stonemaker had this perfect knowledge of God. You know, before dropping off into the ocean with a barn load full of animals, he'd better know God. But a man from 2500 B.C. knowing Jesus Christ, that God had a finger? <laughs> it doesn't look good. John 17:3 says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Friends, we're asked to read the Book of Mormon. Now in Ether 3, how interesting about the body and spirit. Verse 16 says, The body of my spirit. As I appear unto thee to be in the spirit, I will appear unto my people in the flesh. Let's go to the Bible. Jesus explains, Behold my hands and my side, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. Luke 24, 39. But this ether man says, I knew not that the Lord had flesh and blood. In verse 8. In verse 17, Jesus showed himself unto this man in the spirit. Now the problems are compounded. From verse 15, never have I showed myself unto man. Yet in the Doctrine and Covenants 107, 53, and 54, three years previous to the death of Adam, and then later uh, the Lord appeared unto them. It goes on to claim Adam is Michael the prince, the archangel. <laughs> so it wasn't just Brigham who's confused about Adam. But did he show himself unto Adam or not? Or was it not until Ether? There's the conflict. So, Joseph Smith, did this deity appear to you in the grove? Uh, who? Who was it? Uh, was it Jesus who is the Father in Ether 3.14? That means one. No real Bible would say that the Father and Son are the same person. For that error, you have to go to the Book of Mormon. Friend, study the LDS records. Jesus saw a man, an angel, etc. Only one deity. Finally, two. Who could be that mixed up? Remember the angel at the tomb in Matthew 28, 2-4? He single-handedly ruled back the stone. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Matthew 28, 2-4. Clothes like lightning. So you're scared to death. Then later, you're relating this story to say, I'm trying to remember who it was. If I saw God the Father and God the Son, there would never be any doubts in my mind. But from all the diaries, parents, prophets, or whoever, let's see, one or two, and who in the world was it? The official record of the LDS Church says Joseph Smith saw two persons. That theory came around over 10, close to 20 years later. But two, Joseph Smith believed Jesus was the father in the early 1830s. That is not two people. In Ether 2.8, we read, Serve him, the true and only God. 
It does not say serve the God of this world. You know, the God of this world is the devil, right? 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And in Ether 2.12, serve the God of the land who is Jesus Christ. First, we need to explain how is Jesus Christ known to the people of the new world. None of the Old Testament prophets knew his name. So the God of America is Jesus Christ. It would be nice to hear that clarified at General Conference. Are they too unsure to say so? You see, the Mormon Jesus is Heavenly Father, Ether 3.14. He is a spirit brother of a Heavenly Mother and Father in Mormon Doctrine, page 129, 516, 751. He has a fallen brother, Lucifer, in the Miracle of Forgiveness, page 216. He was a sinner who progressed to attain Godhood and preexistence, Mormon Doctrine, page 323. And he is one of three gods, Mormon Doctrine, page 317. He is just one god of many gods, and a pearl of great price, Abraham 4 and 5. This Jesus got married to become a god, so Orson Hyde says, Jesus was the bridegroom at the marriage of Cana of Galilee. If Jesus was not the bridegroom on that occasion, please tell us who was. Journal of Discourses, volume 2, page 210 and 89. Well, sure, we can tell you something about that. If he was the groom, then why was he invited to his own wedding? You see, Jesus is also the grandson of Heavenly Father, quoting the Book of Mormon, 1830 edition, Alma 5:48 as the son of the only begotten of the father, or was Jesus his own son? It's confusing either way. You can see why they did not like the original Book of Mormon. This Mormon Jesus was the son of Adam. Brigham Young in General Conference talks about the LDS believing God is Adam for decades. Journal Discourses, Volume 1, 50 and 51. The LDS Jesus was never virgin born. Not if God had physical sex with his spirit daughter to produce Jesus, Mormon Doctrine, page 546, 547. And if the Mormon Jesus had a heavenly mother, then why didn't God the Father know her? Isaiah 44, 8. Hey, what happens when spiritual leaders do not know God? I mean, if the prophets, seers, and revelators are confused about these foundational issues, who would know if their prophets are even close to the truth today? Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God. And you can still read that in the preface page of every Book of Mormon. In John 8, 24, you see, friend, there are two ways to die, with faith in the right Jesus or to die in your sins. Jesus of the disciples is my Lord and my God, John 20, 28. Hey, dear friend, if you have the right Jesus, you are right for all of eternity. But if you have the wrong Jesus, you'll be wrong forever. Can the Book of Mormon solve the LDS mysteries of God? Maybe a perfect knowledge of God can help us, as from Ether 3.20. Whose finger is this in the chapter? Is it the Father's or the finger of Jesus? Behold, I am Jesus Christ. I am the Father and the Son. Verse 14. Two missionary boys wanted to talk, strong to affirm that they were from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I asked, who is he? This LDS Jesus. Is he the Father? Eternal God, your brother, stopping at the LDS Visitor Center in Independence, Missouri, a missionary was long and bearing her testimony. I commented that President Hinckley was no prophet because he never prophesied. You would better say CEO. She objected he was a prophet because he knew more temples would be built. That's like a contractor saying apartments will be built here. I said, no, it was just a self-affirming prophecy like the Quran saying Muhammad would go to Mecca. Nothing impressive. All he needed was to go there to make it true. But the Bible is his story, history in advance. The Book of Mormon is not accurate prophecy. Miss Faulkner was another missionary and very nice. We talked about the Book of Mormon and how amazing. When the display case had the 1830 edition open to the title page, the very page that we'd been talking about. Then this guy Johansson jumped in to say, The Book of Mormon never changed. He'd gone through it all to compare. I said, Every verse? Loud and emphatic, he said, Every verse. I said, The title page changed. He excused it. I said, The doctrines changed. He demanded where? I said the 1830 edition says Jesus is God. The current edition has changed to Jesus is the Son of God. Johansson bore witness about the Book of Mormon, but not what he wanted to say, responding quietly, well, only twice. His real testimony was like this, I lied, and the church has changed it. Weakly, he said, it was just a problem with a printer in which he inadvertently left out some words. 
That doesn't make sense, I said. Why would he accidentally leave out the same sequence of words on different pages? Why change the Book of Mormon if Joseph Smith got it through the Urim and Thummim with his face in a hat? For whose finger? Who is Jesus? In Ether 3.15, Never has man believed in me as thou hast. Well, it's a good thing. Jesus is not the Father. That's heresy. So this man never saw God. Johansson laughed in denial, but one day his lies will be exposed. Job said, And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, Job 19.26. And we will too. So make sure you're ready. Believe the Father, trust in the Son, yield to the Holy Spirit. Do you want a God after your own making? Or one who can save your soul? There's a huge LDS Institute of Religion near the University of Utah. So what are the seminary teachers teaching these students from all over the earth? What if what they have is not true? Then do not deceive those poor kids. Don't waste their time. Don't baptize them into a false hope. I ask you today, what do the great schools across America teach about the discovery of this country? What about Columbus? What happened with the Vikings? Are all the studies and the history behind these institutions clueless? Were the Jaredites of Ether here first? I don't know about BYU, but the scholars of the world say no. Or are the American Indians the descendants of the Hebrews? The exacting information of their DNA says no. Their customs say no. The linguistic studies of every tribe confirm definitely not. Or if you go to the Smithsonian Institute of Technology, to any of this, they respond, we cannot endorse the Book of Mormon. You can Google their statement to say it is not true. So this Jaredite story is clear enough. But you have other ways to solve it. You can Google, for example, pre-flood artifacts. And it's fascinating. But go to the LDS History Museum across from Temple Square and ask to see the artifacts from the Jaredite civilization. You would not go to South America and Kentucky or even Moab for this. If there is anything at all, you'll find it around Temple Square. Now here's an interesting lesson. The appeal is to read the Book of Mormon. So here in the Book of Mormon, uh, here's what we have. The Jaredites made the first migration to America right after Babel. They are stuck over here in America. Did they know anything about the Apostle Paul? No. Uh, Did they know anything about the futures of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Joseph? Well, you say no. But the Book of Mormon claims they knew all about them. In Ether 4.14, Come unto me, O ye house of Israel. I'd like to ask Prophet Monson to explain this. Uh, These Jaredites would know no more about Abraham or Israel than they knew about George Washington and America. Yet somehow, they knew all about Joseph, Jerusalem, and Egypt, Ether 13, 6, and 7, and that a new Jerusalem should be built upon this land unto the remnant of the seed of Joseph, for which things there has been a type. For as Joseph brought his father down into the land of Egypt, even so he died there, wherefore the Lord brought a remnant of the seed of Joseph out of the land of Jerusalem. Well, you reason it out. Who really heard of the New Jerusalem back then? Some people from the Tower of Babel? No. Or was it someone from the 1800s who wrote the Book of Mormon? Now, here's the second problem for our LDS friends to consider. To really know nothing of the house of Israel, Joseph, Egypt, and Jerusalem from the past, then do you think Mormonism knows anything about the New Jerusalem of the future? The Book of Mormon, is it really God's Word? True or false? You know, I presented this to President Monson and the First Presidency and asked them to talk about it with us. No response. Study it for yourself. You need to know what is really the Word of God. My, your destiny is at stake, friend. Think it over. Another testament is like a mushroom of another kind. Well, further in chapter 2, they were to serve him, the true and only God, the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ, and Jesus is the God of America. The preface page of the Book of Mormon emphasizes Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, even in capital letters and places for emphasis. Whether a spirit child of some heavenly mother or your brother, or is he eternal God? Friend, to trust Jesus Christ, you need to know who he is. Trust him as the eternal God. Take this one as your Savior. And to pray about the Book of Mormon, as in Moroni chapter 10, what about verse 32? It has to be true too, right? 
Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace ye may be perfect in Christ. God forbids ungodliness. Then all ungodliness is everything that God forbids. So to deny yourself of all ungodliness, stop doing everything God forbids or eliminate every sin and then love God with all your might, mind, and strength to never fail. These are the demands of the LDS gospel and God. Only if you do, then is his grace sufficient for you. Moroni 10.32 Now let's hear from the Bible. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, Philippians 3, 9. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain, Galatians 2, 21. Is your righteousness your own? Or through the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God?